We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Hey, let me ask you all a question. Let me ask you a question. How many of you all wake up every morning, the very first thing that you do is you turn on your phone and you take a look at your email or you blaze through social media? How many of you do that? How many of you hate yourselves so much that you start off the day with email? Thanks. Welcome back, everybody. This is Jason Stapleton. You're listening to Wealth, Power, and Influence in the pre-show, which you guys can join. If you want to get part of the pre-show, post-show, all that stuff, the Q&A stuff that we do, uh, just go to jasonstapleton.com forward slash members. It's like five bucks to join, and it's a lot of fun. You can check that out there. But I, uh, I am, I, I don't know, I'm shocked at how many people, I, I, we were talking in the pre-show, I haven't looked at email in a week. I haven't even opened it. And, and I have people who like make demands or who are who need information from me and they have just learned don't email him because he's never going to respond. And so what I do is if you I, here's what I know. I know that if you're really important, you have my cell phone. If you really if I really need to talk to you, I you have my Telegram account and you can Telegram me. You can send me a, a voicemail or a or a text message. Actually, voicemail's pretty poor way to get a hold of me too. Text message and private messenger is really the only way that I work anymore. And, and so I got a call a week or two ago from my accountant. And he's like, uh, oh, hey, man, what's going on? I said, oh, nothing. What's going on? He's like, well, you know, we got to pay some taxes. He's like, I need some stuff from you. And he's, he's like, I just thought this would be easier than emailing you. And I'm like, yep, it works. That's right. <laughs> okay. I also know that when he calls me that it's something I need to handle. It's not something I need to put off. It's something that he really needs from me immediately. And so being the procrastinator I am and going from one uh, deadline to another, I tend to work on things when they are necessary to work on and not before. And I, I, I'm, I get sh- I'm just baffled by how many people allow others to control their day. You see, when you start your day with email or social media, number one, you, you, stand, you stand a good chance of putting yourself into a position where you're going to start your day in a bad note. Because how many people, how much stuff in your inbox is really worth looking at? How much good stuff flows to you through email? Do you go there anxiously like it's Christmas morning going, oh, I wonder what email I got today. Let me go check and see. Or do you look at it as drudgery? Ugh, email. Why do you open it first thing in the morning? Same thing with your social media. How many of you feel better about your lives after looking through social media? At all of the other great things that people are doing, the places they're going, the things that they're seeing on the credit card. How many of you feel better about your life after trolling through Instagram or Facebook first thing in the morning? Then why do you do it? This is, there are things, we build habits every single day. I'm actually going to be talking about this with with our Freedom Accelerator guys this afternoon. Um, We build habits. I think discipline is is largely a waste of time. Um, Discipline really doesn't work. What we really need are great habits. And you have, 90% of what you do is habit-based. And so if you are, you've really got to take a look at your life and say, what am I doing that I don't realize I'm doing? Things like opening up my phone, checking the time, or shutting off my alarm, and then immediately checking Instagram. Does that benefit my life? Does that move me towards the goals that I want to achieve in my life? Or does it move me farther away? And for most of them that you've got, they're probably hindering you. Now, why do I say this? Well, I say it because we very few people are deliberate about their lives. Very few people take action-oriented steps. Very few people even know what their goals are. 
What do you want to what do you want to accomplish this year? How much weight do you want to lose? Do you want to get the promotion at work? Do you want to start the business? Do you want to grow the business? How much money do you want to make at the end of 12 months? Okay? Do you need more friends or less friends? Most people could probably do more with more of the good kind of friends and less of the bad kind of friends. Who's who's dem- who's making demands on your time and on your life that doesn't deserve to? See, most people don't have a clue about any of that stuff. They're just wandering aimlessly through life like a pinball, getting beat around by everybody and everything, constantly running from one fire to another, and letting life happen to them. And you wonder why people are miserable. You wonder why they're not happy. You wonder why they're broke. See, when we wake up, great things happen. In fact, we got an incredible comment and throw a shout out from one of the listeners of this show that we didn't even expect like we, he didn't go to us right he like mentioned the show in a comment yep. okay i want you to listen to this dude's story because this is the guy that i'm talking about this is the guy i want i want a i would take a thousand of these guys over a hundred thousand listeners to some other libertarian show out there that's interested in doing nothing but just whining and complaining have a listen to this guy so this guy's name is Chris Johnson. He commented on a post for the, the Penny Hoarder, which is kind of like a budgeting um, post, and it was about credit scores. He said, I defaulted on two loans and two credit cards after my breakup with my ex. I was 22000 in debt, and my truck was also repoed. I don't make much. At that time, I was making fifteen forty five per hour. Everyone was telling me to file bankruptcy. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I knew I'd ask for the money, and that means it's my responsibility to pay it back. My credit score dropped from a 675 to a 403 overnight. Now, a year and one month later, I've managed to pay off 20000 of it. He's paid off $20,000 in 13 months while making 15 bucks an hour. I also lost my job of seven years last November, so I'm making even less money, but I'm still paying it off. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been living off of 11% of each paycheck since February of last year, and I'm only two to four payments away from being debt-free. Um, as for my credit score, it's a whopping 555. I'm going to pay my only open account down to less than 10% and then use it weekly, paying it off at the end of each week, never going over 30%. So he's got um, some plans for going forward, how he's going to do that. But he said it was an awful experience, but it's one he wouldn't have traded for the whole world. So someone asked him, what did you do to 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 like to accomplish that? How do you how are you possibly living off of um, 10 or 11% of your paycheck? Um, and he said, the first thing is to surround yourself with people who um, who value the same things you do, who believe in you. Um, just as much as everyone else, um, or more than anybody else. But then he also said that um, he started reading a lot, monitoring his online bank account, and cutting things he thought he could go without, like a car. He said he found it was much cheaper to carpool to work. That's, I mean, that's a sacrifice. Um, and then he started listening to this this one podcast called Wealth, Power, and Influence with Jason Stapleton, and of course Dave Ramsey. Um, Damn but, right, Jason so, Stapleton and Dave Ramsey. Don't forget it. <laughs> it's funny we we have two very different um, ways of thinking. In terms of how we approach things, Dave is very much about uh, budget and paying off the debts, and you know, is, is the whole slogan is "live like no one else today, so you can live like no one else tomorrow." And it's essentially live be, live below your means. Now he does on the back end of of the training program because I've been through his course. Uh, does talk a little bit about increasing your income. And if you listen to his show, he'll talk about it too. But what I want is I, I would love it if that guy, he's paying off all that debt. He's he's living be- way below his means. But we, we don't want to survive on $15 an hour, right? We don't want to survive on $15,000 a month. No, 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 no. We, we want We want to live a life of abundance, right? We want to, we want $100,000 a month. We want a million dollars a month, right? Why? Because it's better than $15 an hour. See, uh, money doesn't buy happiness. It just buys everything else. M- b- money is freedom. Wealth is freedom. The more you have of it, the better life gets. I am sick and tired of people talking about money like it's the root of all evil. It's wonderful. Just ask somebody who doesn't have any. Okay? And so why a million dollars a month? Because it's better than 10000 What's the harm? Who have you damaged? If you've made your money by helping others get what they want, if you provided value in excess of what you've charged, what harm have you done? Who has been damaged? The answer is nobody. 
But what I want to do, what what that guy, that guy's got it figured out. He's got the first piece of it figured out. He's figured out if I've got if I'm if I've if I owe people money, I'm a slave. So I gotta stop owing people money. Now what do I gotta do so that I don't ever have to worry about money again? What kind of what kind of skills do I need? Fifteen dollars an hour after seven years is a long time to be making fifteen dollars an hour. There's a lot of years in there where skills can be built. If you want more money, you gotta learn more skills. Gotta find more value in yourself. Gotta build that human capital. Whether you work for yourself or for somebody else doesn't really matter. The more valuable you are, the more you get paid, and the less likely you are to get fired. Yeah, I, I've always said this. If you work for somebody else, your mission, your goal should be so valuable that they couldn't fire you if they wanted to. They're like, look, we could lose everybody else in this company. Everybody. But I can't lose Tony. Tony does too much. He knows too many different roles. I can plug him in anywhere. He's got good leadership skills, a solid head. He shows up on time. He stays late. Dude, he's the guy. I can't lose Tony or the whole business. We might as well just shutter the company. You need to be Tony. I've always been, whatever job I've chosen to do throughout my life, I've always tried to do it better than anybody else. I always wanted to be the best. And so even at jobs I hated, I really hated scrubbing trailers out at Trans Am. When I got out of the Marines, I did a lot of different jobs. Did a landscaping job. Uh, I, uh, I, I, what else did I do? I sold security systems, door-to-door ADT security systems. And the worst job that I had after getting out of the Marines, the worst job I've ever had, period. Cl- a close second was laying um, electric line for cattle. I did that for a summer, and that was not only was it brutally difficult work, it's also very lonely because you're essentially just out there in this field all day long with nothing. And so after I got out, the, the second worst job I had was scrubbing trailers at Trans Am Trucking. So Trans Am has these beautiful white trailers they're rolling down the road. And um, you might see one as you're driving through the Midwest. And if it's all sparkly clean, you might ask yourself, well, I wonder how they keep that white trailer so clean. Well, the way they do it is when they pull that trailer back into the depot, they got a couple of, uh, uh, of guys who have no care for their own human body or their financial situation who will go out there and scrub the gunk off of that trailer. Now, how do we do that? We spray it down with corrosive foam, like a corrosive soap, because you got to eat through tar and all this stuff. And while you're spraying it on, it's dripping all over you and you're getting it. I, for years after I got done with that, my ears would, the insides of my ears would peel and I would just pick, it's kind of gross. I would pick like dead skin out of my ear because that corrosive stuff had been on my, on my skin and it lasted years. You couldn't wear plastic sunglasses out there. Because after a couple of days of wearing plastic sunglasses, they would snap because that soap would sit on the sunglasses and would corrode through the plastic. And then you take these long poles that are about 12, 14 feet long, and you would scrub the side of that trailer all the way down and then spray it off with water so it looked all pretty. And you got paid based on the number of trailers that you did. So that was absolutely the worst job that I had ever had. But even back then I had this, I had this mindset that said, look, I'm not always going to be here. I need better skills. I got to learn something different. How am I going to get out of this? I need more money. And so as you start to, if you want something different for your life, it's going to require better skills. That's all I'm saying. Um, anyway, Let's move on a little bit, and then I want to talk about, we titled this, the, this show today, uh, The Future of the Liberty Movement. I, there's been a lot of, if you follow, a lot of people who follow me follow a lot of other uh, political slash libertarian type of shows, and um, a lot of questions being asked now about where the libert- liberty movement is going, and, and fewer and fewer people talk much about the Libertarian Party. I have uh, I gave up on on the Libertarian Party after 2016. Although I am I'm still a member of of the I am a registered Libertarian, uh, and uh, I don't have I, I don't really have any desire to try and navigate that thing. Actually, Adam Kokesh just sent me a text message this morning. Said, "Hey, would you want to be a delegate this year?" 
And I said, I said, I mean, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could say, I, I'm, if you want to put my name in, go ahead. I said, uh, I, I, thanks for thinking of me. I, I really, I hadn't really thought much of it. And he said, okay, well, I need you to go register as a California, the, the California party. And then after that, I can go down and I can take care of it. And after he said, I got to go do something, then I just lost interest. <laughs> so um, I haven't even responded to him, but I'm basically just going to tell him, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it because it required effort. And then I realized, well, if if I am that quick to shut it down, then I got no business even working in that arena anymore. But what what good is going to come out of me being a delegate? They don't have anybody who's electable. They don't even have anybody that I necessarily agree with in terms. I mean, Adam seems like a fine guy, but he there's no way that I can vote for Adam. We're, we're too misaligned on ideology. My point is this. The win that that the Ron Paul era had in the liberty movement is gone. And I told you it was gone. I said 2016 was the year, and they screwed it up. And everybody keeps coming out. They say, oh, it's going to be even better this year than it was in 2016. And I got a $100 bet going with the head of the Libertarian Party, and he's going to lose. He's going to lose big because nobody is going to vote Libertarian this year. And so what is the future of the liberty movement? What is the liberty movement? Matt, what's, what are we even talking about when we talk about the liberty movement? Because it seems the people in the liberty movement goes everything from constitutional conservative, as far as I'm concerned, from constitutional conservative to anarcho-capitalist. And all of them do nothing but sit around and talk about how the other group isn't the libertarian enough isn't liberty oriented enough so what what are we talking about when we paint with that broad brush i think when people say liber- liberty movement they typically mean basically what you said anybody from constitutional conservative to um full-blown ancap someone who thinks or even like an agorist someone who just tries to opt out of the system um and it's basically someone who's focused on um the idea of limited government I, I think they, they've they've kind of conflated liberty and li- and limited government. They treat those two things as if they're the same. Do you think that's fair? Um, I think it's 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 not unreasonable that they think that, but I think they're wrong. Sure. Um, I tend to I, I my my position has always been in terms of uh, political ideology is just where where you stand with liberty, I stand with you. So we don't have to agree on everything, but where we do agree, I want to move, I want to work with you. And I don't particularly care why you think that way. See, Bernie is in favor of, for example, uh, bringing in drugs from Canada because they'd be cheaper than U.S. drugs. I'm very much in favor of that. Why would we not allow for that? I don't care why he believes that. It's where we have alignment and it, it, it advances what I consider to be um, greater liberty through reduction in regulation and red tape. The problem we have in America today, and specifically with the liberty movement, is that the liberty movement is over and above anything else concerning itself with complaining, talking about how they're smarter, about how they're better, and then going out and trying to change things politically by proving intellectually that they have the better ideas. And I tried this. I will admit, when I first got started behind this microphone, I did exactly the same thing. And about four years ago, three years ago now, I said, this isn't working. We, we are not having the impact. We are not having an effect. What is the point of coming and doing this show every day if we're not having an impact and changing the world in a positive way? In fact, the only impact I was having was on people's individual lives, primarily from just trying to convince them that they are more than they currently think they are and challenging them to do more and be more and take control of their own lives. And that means more than just voting libertarian or supporting liberty candidates. It's about taking change of, in charge of your personal life. And so I decided to radically change the direction of your, this show I shut down the Facebook group. You want to know why? Because it was full of a bunch of whiners and complainers. It was full of a bunch of people who pretended that they had values, 
But really, their values were just about telling other people how terrible they were and how bad their ideas were and how stupid they were and how they were so much smarter and about how if everyone just listened to them, how life would improve and about who are we going to vote for so that then the change will happen. And so now, when we did that three years ago, it was an uproar. People are like, oh, Jason's abandoning the Libertarian Party. Still get emails saying, ah, I wish you'd talk more about politics. You were the best at it. You're damn right I was the best at it. I still am. I'm still the best. Nobody can hold a candle to this show. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's, a little, that's, a little, that's a little far, Jason. No, it's not. You want to know why? Because look at every major Libertarian voice today, and what are they now talking about? They're all starting to abandon this notion of political change and focusing on individual change. You talk about Tom Woods, Michael Malice, who are some of the other voices out there? All of them are moving more towards this idea that what we really need is to make people independent, not dependent. You want to know what the future of the liberty movement is? We are the future of the liberty movement right here. This is where it's at. About you taking control of your life and you making yourself uh, so free, so powerful, so wealthy, so influential that nobody can touch you. That's what the liberty movement is going to have to be if it's going to succeed. And we are that future right here. I mean, you took... I'm, we're listening to, to Dave Smith, and I, I love Dave. Absolutely love him. Dave is intelligent. He is funny. He is, he's, he's got a killer show with a very large audience, and he's, he's struggling over there. He's like, man, what, is, what do we need to do? What's the future of the libertarian movement? Ron Paul is like that. All the wind is out of those sails. See, the problem is, is Dave's done the same thing that I did. Dave has attracted himself a massive audience of people who want to do nothing but sit around and complain, who want to do nothing but talk about how terrible things are and about how they're so much smarter, and they show up on Dave's show because Dave is incredibly intelligent and articulate, and he makes them feel better about themselves. They get to show up and nod and scream at their, at their podcast, at their, at their cell phone or at their radio. Because Dave's telling them what they want to hear. But no change is going to happen there. No, no, the change starts here. The change starts in your living room. The change starts wherever you are right now listening to this show. And short of that, there's nothing that will save this country. Nothing. You are the only one. And if you don't change, if you don't become a person worthy of the liberty that you are subscribed to, the liberty that you are professing, then you will never get there. How are you going to teach your children the importance of liberty when you don't live those values? How are you going to show it to your friends? How are you going to prove that your ideas are better? If you've never tested them, if you've never tried to find a solution other than the ones already out there, if you still work in the system, if you are still subject and slave to the system, how can you possibly tell somebody else how to break free? Who's going to listen to you? You are but a, a, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> Jason's quote in scripture. Are you, I, what else can you do? Nothing wrong with Scripture. We're going to learn a lot from Scripture. That's what you are. You wonder why people don't listen to you? It's because you're sitting around with you're sitting around your, your fast food restaurant making $15 an hour, no offense to our friend, talking about how anarcho-capitalism will save us all. And they're like, dude, you're working the fry thing. You're, you're, like you're, you're, you're not even middle management. You're making 30 grand a year. You, you're way our name tag for a living. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to talk to me about how to fix the world's problems while you're trying to sell me headphones at Best Buy? No. You have to become somebody that people will listen to. Change your life. That's how we revolutionize. That's how we move the liberty movement forward. So you want to know what the future of the liberty movement is? This show me I was ahead of it two years ago I was three years ago I was talking about this stuff 
And once again, I'm proven right. And yeah, I'm a little fired up because I'm that damn good. And if you listen to this show and you follow the prescription that we lay out, you will be too. No no doubt about it. If you do the things I tell you to do on this show, it is a matter of time. It is not if, but when. Because when you change your mindset and you start taking personal responsibility for everything in your life and you start building your way towards a vision where you are no longer subject to anyone, where you control every aspect of your life, when you set that into your mind and you start taking the steps that we talk about every day on this show, it is not a matter of if you will one day break free. It's just a matter of when. The better you are at implementing, the more dedicated you are, the faster you get there. I just, I have been doing this for so long I have seen so many lives changed. I we we read them at the was the end of last year and, and Thanksgiving. It just yeah Thanksgiving just everybody poured in with these comments about how their lives had changed and the great things that had happened to them. And a lot of them had to do with this show. I know it's possible. I don't care who you are or where you are. Yeah. I guess Tony Robbins who said it's not about it's not about resources it's about resourcefulness. How resourceful are you? See most people who started out in life started out with nothing. Very few start out with a silver spoon in their mouth. Some people have more advantages than others, but that's not what makes the difference. If you don't have what you need to get where you want to go today, well then you better figure out how to get it. Because nobody can hold you back but you. I've been thinking about this nonstop for for months now. And one of the big catalysts was when I listened to the debate between Dave Smith and Nick Sarwark. And we've kind of talked about this, I think, on a pre-show before. And I'm not a fan of Sarwark. I I think that he's a snake. I I, I think he's a very good politician. That's that's the thing about Sarwark. He's a very good politician. That's a better way to explain with him. I think because I've I've sat with him several times. I think he's just a very good politician. You're right. So the... In that debate, even though I'm aligned ideologically with Dave, I'm very much in the same vein as Dave. And for those who didn't see the didn't see or hear the debate, basically, um, they were talking about the role of the libertarian presidential candidate. And Dave said that first and foremost, a presidential candidate for the libertarian party needs to be anti-war and anti-Fed. And um, so he and Sarwark were going back and forth on that. And throughout the course of it, I found myself, despite not liking Sarwark and not seeing the world he does. In that, the frame of that debate, I found that I was agreeing with him because he was saying, in essence, my job isn't to convert people to libertarianism. My job as the chair of the Libertarian Party is to get as many votes for the Libertarian Party as possible. That's why the big thing that came out of there was, they, was Dave asked him, well, if Dick Cheney offered to run as the, the president for the presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, would you take him? And Sark was like, yeah because he's a big name and people will vote for him because his job, break yourself out of the, the world of, of shoulds and ideals and, and morals and whatever else. He runs the Libertarian Party. His job is to get votes for the Libertarian Party. Come hell or high water, get votes. And that is politics in a nutshell. This is the problem with politics. Politics does not play the role of changing the world. Politics plays the world of getting as many votes as possible. It's a power struggle. It's just it's just slightly modernized warfare. That's what politics is. So if you go into politics saying, well, I'm going to try to spread my values and morals through this presidential candidate, you're done. You're cooked. You will never be successful because that's not how the game is played. Sarwark knows how the game is played, and he knows that if he puts up a candidate who's anti-war and anti-Fed, nobody will pay any attention at all because nobody gives a crap about anti-war and anti-Fed. And he made one of the most insightful insightful, um, statements in it. He told Dave, "Um, my job isn't to convert people to libertarianism. That's your job. And that was when my mind just, I was like, he's totally right. The conversion is going to happen through culture, through business, through entertainment. Our job as libertarians, if we want to convert other people, we have to do that with our own lives, not by trying to 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 um, to get them to uh, follow a, 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 a political party because it just it that's not how the game is played. The game is the politics is downstream of culture. You have to change the culture yourself. Libertarianism. When people talk about liberty, they say, um, "Well, I'm, I'm advocating for liberty." The vast majority of people, when they hear that, 
they have no idea what you're talking about because liberty doesn't mean it means one thing to one person and another thing to another person which means it means nothing which means it means nothing and when you you're not advocating for liberty really if you're advocating for liberty you're not advocating for anything you should be what are you advocating for you're advocating for liberty for something for what i've said before that that wealth accumulation is the practical application of liberty Wealth accumulation is the practical application of liberty. You want the best environment possible for accumulating wealth. You don't get to change the environment that you're in right now at the, at the macro federal political stage. All you can do is understand how the game is played and then make yourself as wealthy and powerful within the game as you possibly can and then show other people how to do that. People depend upon the state because the state to their minds, the state provides them with services and it and is true. It does. It's, it's the debate is in how good it is, but the fact of the matter is people are dependent upon the state. If you come to them and you say, I advocate taking the state away, they're going to be like, well, screw you. I depend upon it. And then you're like, oh, you're too stupid. You shouldn't depend on blah, blah, blah. You've lost them. Yep. This is basic marketing. You don't come to someone and say, I'm going to take something away from you. If you want them to come alongside you, you come and you say, I'm offering you something different. And right now, libertarians aren't offering anything. Yep. They're just saying the state sucks. And that's it. They're not. They're saying vote for a libertarian candidate. Okay, so you're just like every other political party, just saying, vote for my guy. Like, there's something ironic about the idea that you would have a, an ideology that's built on the idea that that democracy is is a bad thing because, like, like there's there's nothing moral about enforcing your will on everybody else. But libertarians, their political message is we want to enforce our will on everybody else. We want to take over the political system and enforce our will on everybody else. That's just, it's not a message that's ever going to sell to anybody. It's not compelling. It's not interesting. You don't have anything to offer, especially when you're some dopey neckbeard wearing an ANCAP shirt, flipping, flipping French fry or flipping burgers and, and making French fries. It's just not a compelling message at all. So the future of the liberty movement is in people making the most of their own lives and then providing the solutions that can replace all these state services that you hate so much. Yeah. The, the day that it doesn't matter how much you have to pay in taxes because it's a penance, the day when the 50 percent or 40 percent or 70 percent that you pay in taxes is still inconsequential in terms of you providing for yourself and the type of lifestyle that you want to have, then you're free. When you can move any time, any, anywhere you want to, when, you, when government then becomes beholden to you, now you're free. Now, I, I know what I, – I, I, it's so hard for people to wrap their heads around this because there, so many people are going to say to themselves, well, I'm never going to be that rich. I'm never going to be so rich that I won't be able – that, I, I, that government will listen to me. We had a guy that commented on the YouTube stream the other day, and he said, I'm at the point where um, – I'm in the, the boat where like $10,000 a month is unfathomable. I can't even imagine making that much money. I'm just hoping to make enough to pay my bills. So yeah. that, that's, there's that's a lot right. of people that think there that There are way. a lot of people who said – so this is what I would say – to that person like okay how much are you making now oh i make three thousand dollars a month okay i make three thousand dollars a month what would it mean to your life to make four thousand dollars a month what would it mean an extra twelve thousand dollars what do the andrew yang plan what would it mean for you to have an extra twelve thousand dollars a year some people would say man that feel pretty good man at three thousand dollars that's more than 25 percent increase in my salary 25%, that, that'd be incredible. What would it mean to make $5,000 a month? See, for a lot of people, that's just, man, if I could just make $5,000 a month, my life would be set. Okay? Don't, you don't have to think, how, how do I become a multi-gazillionaire so I can give the finger to the state? How about we start with going from three to four? How about we talk about going from four to eight? Okay? See, those are movable numbers. That's something that you can wrap your head around. Then you start saying, okay, well, I make $12,000. Yes, $1,000 a month. How, how do I do that? What new skills do I have to learn? What kind of person do I need to become to make that extra $1,000 a month? What do I need to know? Do I want to try and make that money by getting a promotion at my work? Or do I want to try and make that money starting my own little thing on the side? My response to that is always yes. Yes, you want to do that. Well, which one, Jason? Yes, both of them. Be better than everybody else. Get the promotion and do the side hustle. Keep working that side hustle until it's making you more than your full-time job. And then guess what you do? Then you just drop the full-time job. Now guess what? You're, you're infinitely freer now than you were before. 
That extra $1,000 a month, that extra $2,000 a month, every extra dollar you put in your pocket makes you freer than the day you were before. Some people don't like me talking about money all the time. You can go screw yourself. (laughs) It's the most important thing. Okay? It is what provides you your freedom. It's It's what allows you to pay the bill when your child is sick. Some of you listening to this show have dealt with overwhelming medical issues with your children. As I said, money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure does buy a little bit of peace of mind. Imagine your child having to go to the hospital. And very quickly, because we all know $250,000 in medical bills, $100,000 in medical bills. And you not only have the stress of whether or not your child is going to be well again, but you also know that you have now taken on so much debt that you can't get rid of. Can't default on medical debt. You're screwed. What do you do? Well, that's option A. Option B is that you bust your ass and you make sure that it doesn't matter what happens. That when your child, if and when that day comes, and God forbid it never does, that money is not the concern. The only concern is where do I get the best care for my child? Who's the best doctor? Doesn't matter what it costs. Money's not the issue. Kid gets into the greatest school of all time. He's got real talent, wants to go to Juilliard to learn how to be a concert pianist. Great. How do we get him there? Money's not the issue. Looking at retiring, where do you want to live? Where do you want to go? What kind of life do you want to have? Money is freedom. Self-improvement is what leads to money. A lot of people don't like the self-improvement talks. You can go screw yourself. There's a dozen other shows out there that will do nothing but allow you to yell into your, yell into your cell phone. If you want to be free, if you want real liberty, you have to learn how to expand your own human capital. I've been talking about this for years, people, years. And it's starting to catch on, man. People are starting to listen. It, I feel a shift has happened. Don't you feel like a Absolutely. shift has happened? Yeah. People are talking about it. Other people are listening. Other shows that, that before would have never talked about this stuff are picking it up. They're starting to recognize the value of human capital and the value of making yourself free first. And then becoming a living example of what that means for somebody else. I spent many, many years in the church. Not an overly religious person. I spent many years in the church. And one of the things they constantly harp on there is somebody living your, their values. They say, listen, it's not enough to talk the talk. you got to walk the walk. You want people coming up to you and saying, you know what? There's something different about you. There's something different about the way you live and the way you think and your view of the world. What is it? And then, and then they get hit over the head with the Bible. It's like, well, let me tell you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, again, I am in no way, shape, or form criticizing at all. Please don't take this the wrong way. What I am saying is those of you who spend every, every Sunday in church trying to live your values and then you're going out in the world and trying to profess your liberty values— and you're wondering why people aren't latching on. It's because you're not living that value. You're living, a, you're living the value of a slave. You're living the value of somebody going through the motions who's on the same cog in the same, in the same rat maze that everybody else is in. And they're looking at you going, well, why should I listen to you? Your life is no different. You're no better. Your principles haven't allowed you to create the kind of freedom and wealth that you want. Why would I listen to you? So you make yourself into an example for the change that can happen in other people's lives. The guy right now making living off 11% of his income, he's an example of what you can do with $15 an hour. People listen to him now. Saw a picture of him. He doesn't look like he's more than 25 years old. You got people who have been in debt for a lot longer, with a lot less, making a lot more, who are coming to him and saying, how are you doing that? So let me tell you a story. Here's how I did it. See, live the example that you want other people to follow. Fix you first. Then fix your friends. Then fix your community. We do that, all of a sudden we can fix a nation. We can change the world. 
See, one of the things I hate most about the people we had attracted early on in this show is that they weren't passionate, they were angry. See, angry people can't do anything, but passionate people, well, passionate people can change the world. Passionate people do change the world. Angry people do nothing but complain. They do nothing but lay blame. Oh, it's this guy's fault, or it's that situation, and the taxes are too high. I got to tell you what, guys, I've been waiting for government to change. I've been waiting for taxes to get lower. It ain't happening. Guess what? If I continue to wait on government or taxes to change before I change, before I go after what I want, I'm going to be waiting till the day I die. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting for? If it's something external, if you're waiting for life to be perfect, you're going to be waiting a long time. I've got two points. Do you want to do the ads first? Uh, yeah, we better, we better read some ads. I didn't, realize, <laughs> I didn't realize how long I'd been going. Wow. Okay. Let me tell you about Honey, guys. Apparently, I, t- I gave the wrong URL. I felt really bad about that. Um, it's joinhoney.com slash Jason. Now, you guys should know about this. It should be on your browser if you don't have it. So, Honey is a free uh, Chrome extension plugin that you put onto your Chrome browser. And every time you go to buy something, if there's a coupon or discount code for it, Honey will alert you. And they'll say, hey, this is a site that usually has a discount. Would you like us to try and get you that discount? And you, of course, say yes, because why on earth would you say no? Do you hate money? No, you don't. So you click on yes, and guess what happens then? Honey goes out and searches a string of coupon codes, and if any of them are valid, it's going to give you the discount. I have saved. I'm not kidding you. Every time I go and buy a domain, I just bought two of them the other day, uh, Honey pops up on my browser and says, hey, would you like us to run some coupon codes? I saved saved hundreds of dollars on just website domains in the last 12 months. It's that powerful. And it it works for a ton of different sites. So here's all you need to do. He's like, um, it's free. Go to joinhoney.com slash Jason. That's joinhoney.com slash Jason and just download it. And then start saving money. It's that simple. It's stupid for you not to. So go do it now. Joinhoney.com slash Jason. And we got movement. God, these guys, these guys have been a sponsor for so long. They just sent me another watch. These guys make some really decent watches. I, I've told you guys before, I have uh, a lot of different watches. Some of them very expensive and some of them not so expensive. I have gotten more comments from one of my movement watches than I have any other watch I've ever owned. And it's $95. So they got lots of stuff. How about Valentine's Day? It's right around the corner. They got best-selling sunglasses. They got, uh, they, got, uh, uh, they got sunglasses. They've got, as I said, watches. They got all kinds of stuff there. And you can save 15% off today with free shipping and free returns. Go to movement.com slash Jason. That's, I'm sorry, slash Stapleton. That's mvmt.com slash Stapleton. And enjoy a free extra watch strap and free gift box with every watch you order. Wow, that's great. Go to mvmt.com slash Stapleton. Uh, for your most stress-free Valentine's Day gift ever. It is really simple. If you're looking for something to buy your man or your lady, then head on over there. They're going to give you a bunch of free stuff and save you 15%. Good stuff. And we got Bespoke Post. Love these guys too. This winter, start a new routine to upgrade yourself Every day, your everyday life with a box of awesome from Bespoke Post. Uh, they are so boxofawesome.com is where you're going to go. And here's the cool thing. So whether you're talking about barware or cooking tools or outdoor gear, Box of Awesome uh, has carefully built collections for every part of your life. I got a lot of stuff from these guys, and I love it all. I have a bourbon set from them. I have a couple of bags. It is. Uh, I have. A, I still actually my shaving kit that I take with me when I go on the road is uh, from Bespoke Post and and Box of Awesome. So. The cool thing is, is they each box is about 45 bucks, but it has over $70 worth of stuff inside. Because what they do is they go out and curate um, from people that you do, probably brands that you aren't really that familiar with, but that make really great stuff, uh, and they buy in bulk. So they can buy it at a discount, and then they put it into a box, and they pass the savings on to you. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter code STAPLETON at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code STAPLETON, for 20% off your first box. All right, your points. Okay, so got a couple different points here. The first one was um, you said that the 
you talked about how the, the value is that, that you need to be in the wealth generation business, basically, that all that matters is the money that you're making. And some people will, will um, recoil from that, oh, agree, or whatever. Um, the thing about it isn't just the money. It isn't just the money itself. It's what the money represents. The money represents value created, value that you have brought into the world. If you are making a lot of money, that means you're bringing a lot of value into the world. That's what that's so the, the money is just a proxy for that value. And when you bring that value into the world, number one, it, it does two things. Number one, it's your security. It's your security blanket. People that bring lots of value into the world have lots of people who want to advocate on their behalf. Um, so if, you know, worse things, if things go, go really bad, then you have um, something that you, that you have a, like a flag that you can raise. This is I'm the person who brought all this value into the world and people are going to advocate for me. Um, the second thing that it does is um, it is, I can't remember what the other thing was going to be. Um, it was, it was along the same lines, basically that it's, if you're making a lot of money, um, what you're doing is you're bringing tons of value into the world. It's your security. And, um, and it's ultimately the thing that provides you um, uh, your own security in terms of, of having a lot of assets that you can use to buy your freedom. Um, the other thing I was going to say is we have a, a, a $20 super chat on our YouTube live stream from Peacekeeper. And he said, shouldn't people who believe in freedom also pursue political power and positions as well as wealth building? And I'll just give my answer on that real quick and pass it over read to you. It, read it again for me. He said, shouldn't people who believe in freedom also pursue political power and positions as well as wealth building? So what I would say from that is, is, is um, in the conversation with between Dave and, and Nick in that debate, um, one thing um, Nick pointed out was the fact that um, this, the 2016 election was the first time that the Libertarian Party covered the spread between the other two um, uh, parties. And that's, that's actually a big deal, especially if that continues, if that trend continues. You don't have to win the election or be really competitive in the election to affect the, the, the political process. Um, and so there's there's some strategic if you take the the ideology out of it and you just look at, at politics as just like a sport, um, there's strategic value in being a thorn in the side of the other two parties because it forces them to have to cater to you in some way. So there is value in that. I wouldn't I wouldn't tell people not to be involved in politics, but I would say if you're going to go into politics, do it within this context that you recognize that this is just it's just a part of life. This isn't the end all be all it's just um it's it's an area where you can apply your time and money but first and foremost you should be in the business of of securing your own future and securing your own um your own wealth because of the security it provides you and then from that you can get into the political i I, I would just i uh, fair I, I think that's fair I, I i would answer a little differently I, I would i would point out that the people who are in who have political power don't have real power a, a president has some authority and people who are in those positions have authority, so they have the ability to act and, in many cases, use force. But they don't have real power. The real power happens behind the scenes. The real power comes from, you notice Jeff Bezos isn't running for president. You, you notice that uh, that neither are any of that. Well, you've got uh, Michael Bloomberg now who's like r running in his 80-something or whatever, late 70s, and now he's looking at doing it. You have the only time these guys ever go into politics is when they've amassed so much wealth that this is just something that they want to do. Okay? And so what I would say is if you want to pursue political power, great. Pursue the pursue the individual liberty and wealth first, because it makes everything else infinitely easier. See what you what you normally see. Take the Kennedys for example, these dynasties that exist in our government. Uh, you have um, the you know even the, well let's not get into it. let's use the Kennedys as the, as the example. So you had moonshine Grandpa Kennedy who ended up making a fortune during the Great Depression and during Prohibition. And with all that great wealth, he bought political power, and his sons became his son became president, and they they became uh, senators. And still today, Kennedys reside in the halls of power. It is a way to protect and control wealth that political power is typically used by those who who can truly wield it. Um, your average Joe working in the Senate has no real power. Oh, he is beholden to the money gods that show up every day saying, if you want my money, you will vote this way. And you even see a lot of the people who hold out. This is something I learned uh, many, many years ago. But when you see people holding out and saying, well, I'm not real sure how I'm going to vote, what they're really doing is waiting around for the right people to cut them a check. And they hold out till the very end because they know that the money will come the longer they stay on the fence. 
And so they start deciding whoever's going to write the biggest check is the one who ends up getting the vote. This is what happens. You are not in a position of political power if you show up to Washington with no money. If you show up with money, then typically what you're going to do is you're going to install a surrogate. And you don't even need to worry about it anymore. If you're going to put a family member in there, it's because you want it to stay in the family. But the wealth, the power, the influence exists outside of Washington. And you lay that wealth, power, and influence on the people who are in Washington. It is a fallacy to believe that that is where the power and the money originates. So it is a way, it, government is used as a way to control competition, largely. And so you see wealthy and powerful people using it for that end. And I, listen, get money, get power, get, get influence, and then you use it ethically and honestly. That's, that's what we really want, right? That's what, that's what we're talking about is, hey, if you want things to change, then you be the one with the money. You be the one with the influence and the power, and then you choose to use it ethically. You choose, it to, get, you choose to get these guys to vote for, for example, uh, term limits. Okay? Just get them out after a certain amount of time. You use it to roll back regulation and to fight for that. That's the way we change things. That's the way you get, and then you get thousands and thousands and millions of other people advocating for the same thing. So now you have the money and the voice and the will of the people all moving in the same direction. And when that happens, these guys are screwed. They can't do anything. They're going to fold like a cheap suit because they're all spineless cowards. Who do you think has more influence on politics and on the culture, Joe Rogan or Gary Johnson? Joe is, uh, is undeniably without Joe, a doubt. Joe has a larger audience than than most CNN or or Fox um, talking heads. You know, you know how much you know how much value how much how free let's do this. You know how free Joe is. Joe's so free that when Biden called him up and said, "I want to come on your show," when he was the leading candidate for the Democratic nomination, he said, "Nah, I I, I don't want to talk to you. You you bore me." There's nothing new about you. There's nothing interesting, and I don't want you. When any other news outlet would have begged, begged to have him on the show, would have been over backwards to make it happen. Joe Rogan's like, ah, whatever. I got more important things than this guy. This guy's a non-factor. And guess what? He is a non-factor. But who do you think's more free? The guy sitting behind a desk at CNN or Joe Rogan? See, Joe owns it all. Joe controls the source of his wealth. Guy behind the desk doesn't control the source of his wealth. He's got to do what he's told. He's got to read what's on the prompter. He doesn't get to say no. He says no, they're going to get somebody else. See, great income is great. Having Making lots of money is perfect. Until you control the source, until you control it all, you're not going to be free. You will always be subject to someone. Joe doesn't have that problem. You don't have to have that problem either. If you have that problem, it's by choice. Now we're back to personal responsibility. When we say politics is downstream from culture, um, it, it, I mean, this is an Andrew Breitbart aphorism, and it's, and it's uh, I guess for those who do, don't necessarily understand it, it means that, that politics flows out of culture. So the culture, the culture changes, the culture um, develops in a certain way, and then the political out- outcomes um, come from that because politicians, uh, politicians don't have real power, but they have the ability to be the public face that frames the narrative. Um, and they're going to frame a narrative that they believe already has public support in some way. Now, a lot of this stuff gets, gets gamed from the top. Um, from people, they, they, it, you get the whole thing of the cathedral where you have um, stuff is created in the universities. It's inculcated and indoctrinated into people's minds. And then at the right time, the politicians come out and they kind of cement this, this narrative into the public consciousness. And a lot of this was possible because of the, the monopoly that they had on the narrative through the media. So really, the politicians were kind of an arm of the media, that the media would establish all these narratives and then the politicians would institutionalize it. Um, but it would only like gay marriage is the, is one of the best examples. It was like on a dime, all of the politicians just flipped. Now there's, you won't get a single Republican who advocates against gay marriage because it's political, it's political suicide because it's cultural suicide. Yeah. It happened because the culture changed. The thing about libertarian political, um, the libertarian political message is that it's not culturally palatable right now. The reasons it's not culturally palatable is because 
of there's such a powerful indoctrination machine that has trained people to believe that they're dependent, that the the key to success and happiness is being dependent on the right set of politicians who are backed by the right set of corporate interests or whatever. That that has to change in order for the politics to change. So there has to in 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 um in business speak, it's like you need to decrease the demand for the government. But in order to cre- to decrease the demand for the government, you have to take those things that people are um seeing the government as providing that service. You have to replace that with something different, where they no longer see the government as the best possible solution. So you have to provide that solution first. Once that's done, once people are amenable to um the idea of whatever the libertarian free market solution is for something, you no longer need the libertarian party because people who are already looking to the market to provide for their services, they aren't looking to the government. You don't need a libertarian government because they don't want the government. So this is why I say the libertarian political party will never be viable because the moment that it becomes viable, it will no longer be necessary. People won't need it at all. So it's interesting as a strategic tool to use to play spoiler and to to um, kind of get people on a platform or whatever. But a lot of that is still is 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 old technology. It used to be that if you wanted to become a ma- major player with a lot of eyeballs on you, you had to get through one of the main. It was it was everything was 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 narrowed through this one gate that you had to get into some major corporate press um, TV show or something. That's no longer the case. You can go on Joe Rogan. You can create your own podcast. The internet has has created. Um, it's really leveled the playing field in this sense. And this is why we're seeing so much hysteria within the media because they're realizing they don't control the narrative anymore. So the idea, even that you're going to use the libertarian political party as a marketing tool, I think it's, I think it's just not a good marketing tool anymore either. It used to be, it used to, that idea at least made sense. Now that idea doesn't even make sense anymore. You can, you can create a a podcast or start a business and start on speaking out publicly as an an influential business owner or, or venture capitalist or something. And you can have way more impact on the on marketing libertarianism than if you were just the libertarian political part or libertarian presidential candidate. Absolutely. Because it's, it starts with you. It starts, it's a why not you? Okay? Why not now? Why not right this minute? Why not today? Guys, I, I want to thank you for being on the, for listening to the show today. And I'd like to ask you to do something. If you thought this show was valuable and you thought, think someone else needs to hear it, um, I'd love it if you'd share the show with them. Share it with uh, two or three people that you think uh, would enjoy it and would get something out of it. Kind of a kind of a rough episode today to share with somebody who might be a little appalled because we talk about some pretty serious stuff on today's episode, and and uh, I, I was not pulling any punches. But um, find a few people that you think the message would resonate with and then send it to them. And uh, and then leave us a rating and review on iTunes, five stars if you think it's worth it. You got something to say? Yeah, go ahead. I'd say go share it in, in um, into other... Oops, the, the other libertarian here. groups? Yeah, go show it into other libertarian groups yeah. where where like get this message out there. I've this this is the message that libertarians need to hear. There a lot of people they don't have any direction right now. They're trying to figure out what to do. And this is where they they see business and entrepreneurship and self-help and motivation all that. They see that as a separate thing from libertarian politics. And what we're saying is that it's that this is it's libertarian politics. Yeah. This is where libertarians need to be focused. And if you like, if you listen to the show today and you're like, Jason, I'm, I'm on board. I just, I, I need a little, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Um, well, then here you go. I'll talk to you guys soon. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor. Subscribe and then share it with a friend. And if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life, income, and future, then I'd like to help. Just go to controlthesource.com to get started.